All right. Uh, I think we're just going to go ahead and get started. Um, so, hello, my name is Zaid. I am a solution architect here at Tyke. And our motto is connect every system in the world. This is what we strive for. And hopefully we will get there one day. Uh, and uh, for now, I will show you what Tyke is. I will talk about a little bit about APIM. And we can have a discussion about uh, some of the features and the cool stuff that Tyke has. So there you go. This is me, a better looking picture of me right now. COVID has taken its toll on me. <laughs> and yeah, so what we will talk about today is uh, what is APIM? Uh, we'll talk about what differentiates us, uh, Tyke, uh, from our competitors. We'll go through uh, an overview of our uh, architecture. And I'll take you through a brief brief product demo. So what is an APIM? So an APIM is an API management platform. And just reading off the slide, it is simply a system that helps with building, securing, monitoring, and supporting of APIs. So this is the on-paper definition of this. Uh, the way I would like to define it, an APIM, it's, it's a tool that will allow uh, users, which are mainly developers, to focus on uh, uh, your your business logic and leave all the extra stuff for us to handle, such as authentication, uh, monitoring, analytics, all that stuff, so that they don't have to worry about this. And it, we are professionals, we are professionals in that field, we'll manage it for you and you guys can focus on your business logic and that way you can have uh, more time uh, to do what uh, you need to do. So <clears throat> here are some of our biggest differentiators, uh, differentiators between us and our competition. And I'll go through them one by one. Uh, deployment flexibility is the first one and this is very important because uh, as a customer, you don't want to be locked into a certain cloud. So, for example, if you're with AWS or Google or not, uh, they, they tend to, uh, to lock you in uh, and only allow you to use their stack. And that could be really difficult for some users. So we don't lock you into any specific cloud. You can actually deploy take on any cloud. You can deploy it in, uh, on your own infrastructure, on, you know, uh, some of the top uh, clouds out there or, you know, some smaller clouds. So it's, it's up to you. You can do whatever you need to do with that. Uh, the batteries included part is also very important. Some of our competition tend, tend to uh, either not give you a lot of stuff out of a lot of uh, tools out of the box so that you can manage your APIs or they make you pay for them. With Tyke, you will actually be able to get a set of functionality, a set of middleware or uh, plugins that you'll use to manage your APIs. And I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit in a demo. Highly secure. This is one of my favorite ones. So uh, Tyke is an open source product. Our gateway is open source. So you can actually go in there and view the code and play around with it, try to poke holes. So it's very secure for that reason. We have uh, a huge... Uh, open source community that helps us with security. And uh, we also don't phone, ho phone home. So that increases uh, the level of security there. Our own stack. So Tyke is built on its own infrastructure. So for example, um, we have Kong, one of our competitors, they're built on top of uh, uh, different tools. Uh, so, for example, Tyke doesn't actually rely on anyone. Uh, if you if you uh, run into a problem, if there is a bug, we are going to be the first ones that you reach out, and we're also going to be the last one that you reach out to. We won't have to go to anyone on, or anywhere because um, everything is built on our own infrastructure. Uh, the last thing, and it is my... Uh, more, uh, my favorite uh, thing about Tyke, which is the univer universal data graph. And I'll actually show you an example of the universal data graph. Uh, so the universal data graph is a solution that Tyke created to help you manage uh, your different API products and display them as a GraphQL endpoint. 
So what's cool about this is that GraphQL or uh, Universal Data Graph will allow you to stitch different APIs, REST APIs, GraphQL APIs together, and that will allow you to pre and it will allow you to present them as one single GraphQL API. All right. So looking at the architecture of Tyke, um, and sorry if anybody has any questions, please uh, write them into the, in the chat. I have a few of my colleagues here. So we'll be able to, they'll be able to answer some of your questions if I do not see them. If not, we can always, uh, there is a QA section at the end of this and uh, I'll try to answer questions as I see them. So getting back to the architecture type. So as you can see, uh, it's pretty simple. We have, uh, in this diagram, we have four different parts of type. We have two different dependencies and the rest are just uh, the users. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is the gateway. Uh, so the gateway is the workhorse of the type product. It is a, uh, open source. It will always be open source, not open core. It's open source. So everything is out there. Um, and we publish our gateways, those open source gateways in our paid product, with, whether it's enterprise or you know, your traditional licensing. It's always the same thing. So the gateway will uh, be able to do what you want from a gateway. It takes care of analytics. It takes care of uh, reverse proxy requests, authentication, authorization, all that fun stuff. Uh, however, it is headless. And this is why you pay for Tyke. So the paid product of Tyke is what you see in the dashed box in here, uh, which is the portal and the dashboard. Uh, so what the dashboard provides is it provides a way to orchestrate all your different gateways and manage them. Uh, as mentioned, it, the gateways are headless, so uh, and they can't communicate. If you have multiple gateways, they can't communicate with each other, and that's where the dashboard steps in, provides an or uh, orchestration layer for that for those that, uh, for those gateways, as well as it provides a UI. Also provides uh, some key functionalities like uh, introducing users and user groups and identity management and all that fun stuff. Uh, the second part of this is the portal. So uh, the portal or what we call the developer portal is what will allow you to publish your APIs um, uh, to your consumers. Uh, it will allow you to uh, publish documentation with that. It will allow you to monetize your product and it will allow you to allow your customers to self-serve. So developers can access the developer portal. Uh, they can go in, they can sign up, they can view your APIs, they can request keys for those APIs and you can manage uh, the actual workflow of these uh, request uh, processes. And uh, those customers or developers or consumers can uh, get access to those APIs and start playing around with them. Um, furthermore, we have Redis on Mongo, and these are our only two dependencies outside of the type stack. So Redis on Mongo can both read. So if you're on uh, <clears throat> Google Cloud or AWS or uh, Azure, you can replace these with the platform uh, products that these clouds have. So uh, for example, Redis can be uh, replaced with uh, Redis Cache on Azure and uh, Cosmos DB for MongoDB. And same goes for AWS, you got Elastic Cache and I think Document DB and so forth. So what do we use Redis for? Redis is used to store API keys for the gateway so it can access those keys uh, as fast as possible. It's an in-store, uh, in-memory uh, store for the gateway. It also temporarily stores your analytics. So when a request comes in, the gateway takes uh, down some information about the request and the response, and that is temporarily stored in Redis. Obviously, you wouldn't want to litter Redis and slow it down with the analytics. So that's where Mongo comes in. So Mongo stores the analytics uh, long term. It also stores your API definitions. It stores your user information, uh, your user groups, all the, uh, all the config for your dashboard as well. And the last piece that I wanted to talk about is the type pump. So the type pump is uh, basically what allows you to uh, move the, those temporary analytics from Redis into Mongo, but it's not the only, Mongo is not the only data sync that exists. So if we go to the next slide, 
you can see here that we have a lot of different data syncs that are supported out of the box by the pump. And uh, the type pump is also an open source product. So you can actually jump in there, see the code. You can actually create, create your own drivers for your own data syncs. Uh, so it's very customizable. All right, so here I'm just going to take a look uh, at the benchmarks for Tyke. Uh, so the first column, you see the EC2 machine. Uh, so the EC2 machine that we use, GT T2 micro, so very small uh, machines. And we go up to C59X large, which is, again, very, very large. So the max throughput just shows you the maximum uh, requests per second that was performed by each of these machines. The P99 latency, it just shows you that 99% um, of the requests of those 3,000 requests, for example, for the T2 micro, have, have a latency of, three point, uh, of approximately 32.9 uh, milliseconds. And the last column is your EC2 cost, so how much you're spending uh, per hour. Now, this is really important because, as you can see, the T2 micro is very, very small and is able to handle approximately uh, 3,000 requests per second. Um, so, uh, and uh, also what you can see here is that Tyke can uh, scale horizontally as well as vertically. So, the bigger the box, you can get uh, more requests in. Also, you can deploy uh, multiple gateways and that will allow you to handle more requests. All right, um, I do not see any questions in the chat, so I'm going to go ahead and jump to the demo. And before I do that, no, I jumped to the QA slide too. So before I jump, in, uh, I jump into the demo, I'm just going to quickly tell you about uh, uh, how you can actually uh, POC take if you'd like. It's very straightforward. You can actually go to our website. Take.io. And if you click on start free trial, you can actually fill your information in. So I have filled in previously. Let's go ahead and click next. And then you can uh, decide what you want to trial it on. So you can obviously do the open source, which is open source. So you can use it for as long as you want. However, it is headless. Uh, so that's where our cloud and self-managed licenses come into play. So if you want an easy way to deploy, you can just go on the cloud and you'll get set up with Tyke and uh, start reverse proxying uh, your requests. Uh, the other one is self-managed. And uh, my favorite way of setting up self-managed is to use this uh, GitHub repo. It's Tyke Pro Docker demo under Tyke Technologies uh, GitHub. And it, it just basically allows you to set up Tyke locally very, very easily. And uh, now what I have here for you today is, uh, is actually ran locally. So I, as you can see, I have logged out here. But I'm just going to go ahead and log in. I'm going to show you the dashboard. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, I just saw the question here. Uh, can we swap uh, dependencies for Redis and Mongo for anything else? Yes, we can. So Mongo and Redis, as I said, can be replaced with the platform services on the big cloud, such as uh, um, uh, Google, AWS, and Azure. However, you could also, uh, or sorry, in the next version of Tyke, which is 4.0, that should be coming in this quarter, we are actually introducing SQL as a replacement for Mongo. So stay tuned for that. Uh, I just got another question. Can Tyke be deployed into Kubernetes cluster? Absolutely can. Uh, I'm just going to quickly show you. Let's look up Tyke Helm. And the first thing that you're going to uh, see here is our Tyke Helm chart. So our Tyke Helm chart repository is a Helm chart for all our different products, whether it's the Tyke Pro, which is the paid version, Tyke Hybrid, or Tyke Headless. So you can go in there, you can install the actual Helm chart, and uh, that will help you install your uh, uh, Tyke into Kubernetes. Pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, if you have any problems, you can always reach out to us through our uh, community forums or uh, through the contact us page on uh, on the Take.io website. So yeah, as you can see, pretty straightforward. Like if we go into the Take Pro version, 
it actually describes what uh, um, commands you need to do uh, or you need to add, and it's pretty st uh, straightforward. So if you just uh, clone the repo, uh, add the Helm chart, and it shows the values, and if you run it, yeah, this, the installation is somewhere here. It takes you back to the website, and you can actually see the installation. Anyway, going back to the demo, so this is the Take Dashboard, uh, and it's just my local dashboard, so it doesn't have that many uh, uh, stuff in there. Uh, I just sometimes test uh, some APIs in here. I do some demos, so it's just here to show you what it would look like. So uh, your Activity Dashboard will show you the requests that you got in Take. So you can see all the different requests uh, per day, the errors, you can filter it down, play around with it. The other thing that I wanna show you here is it actually, you can actually see a breakdown of all the errors that uh, your requests uh, encounter. So you can see all these different requests, they're broken down by uh, the different error code. Next we'll see is activity by API. So you have all this, these different APIs uh, and you'll see all the requests, successes, errors. You can also filter it by API keys. So you give your customers different API keys or your developers different API keys and you can actually filter analytics based on that specific key. And errors, again, this shows you a nice overview of the errors that you've had. Uh, versus successes, and it will actually show you a breakdown of all the different errors that you might have gotten in the last, you know, X amount of time. Uh, log browser, this is definitely my favorite one. Uh, the reason for that is I am a developer by trade. So this will allow me as a developer uh, to actually see what requests are coming through my, uh, my gateways, and it will actually show me a uh, little bit more detail. So uh, it will show me some of the details here. Uh, however, uh, it will also I can also see the request and response uh, for each of those requests if I turn it on. So unfortunately, I don't have it turned on. We can actually turn it on as part of the, the demo and I, I can actually show you uh, what information uh, we will capture. So we'll get back to this uh, in a little bit. So let's go ahead and create our first API. So we're gonna show you how easy it is to create APIs with Tyke. And we'll click add a new API. We'll type in hello Tyke for the API name. And uh, just to quickly show you what the target URL is, uh, it's just a Neko server. So if I hit uh, the JSON endpoint, you're just gonna spit back some JSON to me. So let's go ahead and try this. So let's configure the API. And I'm not gonna talk about all the different uh, boxes here because if I start talking about it, honestly, we're not gonna be done until tomorrow. So I'm gonna skip ahead and I'm just gonna open the authentication to be keyless for the time being. And I will save this. Just gonna go back in there and grab this URL. So this is what you would get if you were to hit httpbin.org slash JSON. And if you were to hit this API that's proxy through Tyke, you will get the same result. So this is it is this easy to proxy uh, an API through type. Um, I see that Taylor has asked a question. Do I have to access logs through the browser here, or uh, I can make a custom request? You can so going back to the dashboard quickly. So everything that you see me do. Uh, under the hood is an API request. So for example, uh, me updating, saving, and creating uh, an API, me viewing these different analytics, all this stuff is a REST uh, API call. Uh, if you wanna think of, what you wanna think of the dashboard is it's a thin layer of API sitting on very powerful uh, REST uh, set of REST APIs. So everything can be done through uh, an API. Uh, this is really, really important actually, because uh, when you wanna do some CICD uh, work, uh, you can uh, do a lot of the work uh, through uh, the tech APIs. So anything you can do in the dashboard uh, through the UI, you can also do uh, through a REST call. So jumping back to the HelloTech uh, endpoint. So as you can see, 
now we have our first API. So let's start playing around with it. And the first thing I want to look at is the uh, authentication uh, methods. So as you can see, Tech has a lot of different uh, ways to authenticate. Uh, on top of uh, this list of known authentication mechanisms, we also allow you to do custom authentication. So if you want, if you want to do something uh, different than those uh, uh, authentication mechanisms, then you can go ahead and do that. So it's very customizable in terms of authentication. So I'm going to go ahead and select uh, authentication token, and. Uh, as you can see here, Tech allows you to set the header name that it's going to look for the other authorization token under. You can also pass uh, authorization through a query parameter or use a cookie value, or you can enable client certificate. Uh, for the EC use, we're just going to go ahead and use the authorization uh, header name and update. And to do this, I'm just going to copy this uh, URL. I'm just going to jump into my Postman to show you guys what we're doing. So we're going to paste this, and I'm going to add authorization. I'm just going to type in a dummy value. So now it's going to tell me, hey, you do not have access to this API. The reason for that is you don't actually have a proper key. So let's uh, go ahead and create our first key. So I'm going to add a key. I'm going to select the actual API, which is hello type. I'm going to go ahead and configure it. I'm going to set that this say that this does not expire, and I'm going to create this key. I'm going to hit OK, and we're just going to jump back into Postman and copy uh, and paste that key. And now we have access to our API again. Now managing keys uh, or like uh, a key is it can be very difficult. Let's say you have uh, ten customers or a customer that has ten users and has ten keys and. Uh, you want to manage those keys. It gets really difficult if you're going to go into every single key and uh, change some of the access rights. Uh, you know, okay, you can apply uh, rate limits and quotas. It gets really tedious. So uh, what we introduced to solve that is a policy. So a policy is a way for you to manage multiple keys as well as publish your uh, APIs to your development portal. So let's talk about the first part here uh, and add a policy. So I'm going to... So obviously you can do one API or multiple APIs. So a key can give you access to one or multiple APIs. You're not restricted to one only. So I'm gonna go ahead and select this one API and I'm just gonna jump in here and I'm gonna say, this is gonna be the hello type policy. And I'm gonna say that this will not expire. I'm gonna go ahead and create this. And we're gonna get, we're just gonna jump back into keys. Actually, I'm gonna add a new key, and I'm gonna create that key under this policy. I'm gonna hit create key. I'm gonna copy this, and we're just gonna jump back into Postman, and we should have access to this API through the policy this time. So now, okay, let's see how powerful policies are. So let's say I ha I already have an existing key. And I want to apply rate limits and quotas on this. So I'm going to enable this uh, rate limiting uh, section here. I'm going to set this to three uh, requests per 60 seconds. And I'm going to hit update. So we're just going to jump back into Postman. I'm going to send one, send two, send three. And now what I should expect is rate limit exceeded, which I do get that. All right, awesome. So. Uh, rate limiting and quotas. So that's another thing that I wanted to talk about here is, so rate limiting quotas can be applied per key specifically, per key per API. So for example, you can actually set rate limits and quotas for the key itself or for the key based uh, or for the key per that API, uh, per specific API. So you can do that as well. Uh, another way you can set rate limits and quotas, you can actually set them for uh, in the API definition as well. Uh, you know, that way you want to just allow 1,000 hits uh, for your backend at a time, then that's what it is. I will just manage it for you. So really cool stuff, right? So we're just going to jump in here and talk about versioning a little bit. So uh, by default, we, don't have, we do not have versioning uh, unlocked by tech. But if you jump in here and you want to use versioning, then you can go ahead and do so. Uh, the really cool thing about versioning, uh, let's say you have, uh, you know, version one and version two, and you want to ease version two into production or 
uh, you want to keep two different versions because your customers are using two different versions, then you can go ahead and do this. And what Tyke will allow you to do is multiple things. So let's go ahead and create version two right here. So first of all, what Tyke allows you to do is it will allow you to overwrite the tar target host. Let's say you have your version one sitting on uh, server one and version two sitting on server two then you can actually override the target host and send a version two request to the second target host. You can also set an expire date for this. So for example, I know in my default version or version one uh, is going to be uh, expired or I want to expire that or kill that at a specific time, then you can actually set the expire date if you'd like. For now, we're just going to leave those two fields empty and we're going to go ahead and add a version. Now, Tyke will look by default, will look for the versioning information under uh, the header value X API version. So if I go ahead and save this and I try to hit uh, this endpoint, it's going to tell me version information not found, which is what we expect. So uh, sometimes you don't want that to happen and you want to set a default version. So you can actually select a default version here and say, okay, this is going to be the default version. So if there's no version information in, I will actually be uh, the default. The default version will be my default version. I guess maybe I should have used the version two, so it's more clear. But <laughs> it's too late now. All right, so I want to use version two right now. So I'm going to set this to version two. I'm going to hit send. I'm like, oh no, access is denied. Why is that? The reason for that is again, our policy uh, allows access to your API for the default version only. So let's go ahead and add that to our policy and we'll hit update. And now we should have access to our API again, which we do. Awesome. So let's just jump back in there and let's talk a little bit about some of the out of the box features uh, that Tech provides. So uh, my favorite uh, one to demo is uh, our body transformation API. So body transformation allows you to uh, go in and transform the body of the request or the response. So for example, here, let's go ahead and go to httpbin.org slash XML. So this is what we're expecting out of the XML endpoint, right? So let's go back in there and we want to change that to, um, we want to change that into JSON. So I'm going to uh, hit this XML endpoint and we're going to do body transformation. We're going to say that the response is going to come in as XML. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the JSON Marshall uh, function that is provided through Golang. I'm going to pipe what, all the XML that I get through that JSON Marshall function in the response. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, close this for now. Oh, too many clicks. I'm also going to add a header, uh, a modified header uh, tool. Uh, the reason for that is the response is going to have a content type of XML and I want to change that to JSON so that when I see it or uh, when I receive it back, Postman or my uh, browser or whatever tool is going to understand what kind of uh, information is getting back. So I'm going to go ahead and update and let's jump in here and say, okay, I want to go to the XML endpoint. And now you can see this is the XML endpoint uh, on version two, which we set up here. So if we go to version two, you can see we set this uh, endpoint designer uh, functionality here for version two. And uh, you can see that it's transformed into JSON. So if I go ahead and disable this and go back to the default, I'm actually going to get back XML. So again, really cool here. Uh, the next thing I wanted to show you guys is, uh, let's see, the mock response. So this is really cool for your developers. Uh, you know, like if you have multiple teams working on the same project and you don't want to slow anyone down, you can do mock responses. So let's go ahead and say, okay, this is going to be a mock response. I'm also going to add a whitelist because a mock response requires that so that it's ignored. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and edit the mock response. And I'm going to say, okay, again, this is going to be a JSON. So let's set the content type to JSON. We'll add this. And let's say this is going to be returning. Oh, really can't type today. Hello. And type. And we'll close the squiggly bracket. 
I will go ahead and update. All right, so let's go back to version two again. And now we have the mock endpoint. And I'm gonna go ahead and test this. And there you go, now we get Halotech. If we disable this, I think we'll get an error because there's no, uh, excuse me, uh, there's no uh, mock endpoint on the uh, HTTP bin. Awesome, so now we have our mock endpoint, really cool again. Lastly, what I want to show you is the virtual endpoint. And this is easily my favorite uh, uh, tool that comes out of the box for type. So the virtual endpoint, uh, think of the virtual endpoint as a, as a serverless JavaScript function. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this in line. You can obviously uh, upload or sorry, not upload, add a file to your uh, gateway and uh, 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 access it from here. And I'm just not going to type anything. This is just going to return. This is the virtual endpoint code 200. Obviously, uh, the sky is the limit here. So you can do whatever you need to do here. You can uh, try to proxy other endpoints, try to do some custom logic to verify the request before it passes on, uh, uh, and so on. So I'm going to go ahead. I don't know what I call that. So yeah, maybe we should give it an endpoint. So virtual endpoint. We're going to go ahead and update. So if we hit the VE endpoint here, we're going to, oh, sorry. Let's take another look. What did I do here? VE virtual endpoint request endpoint is forbidden. Interesting. All right, let's try virtual. I don't know if VE is something that we need. Okay, nice. Not entirely sure. Yeah, the version is correct. Did I virtual get request? Oh, yeah, virtual path. Everything looks good. Well, the demo gods uh, do not seem to like me today. So I don't think I'll be able to continue the demo for the virtual endpoint. I'll probably have to look into that and see what went wrong. Uh, but typically what you would get back is this is a virtual endpoint response and uh, will work normally. But demo gods are mad at me. I don't know what I did this morning, but they seem to hate me at this point. All right, so other, other than the... Uh, then these endpoints uh, tech allows you to use uh, or to add custom plugins and custom plugins can be uh, added to various uh, stages of the middleware chain, uh, which, uh, which I'm showing you right now. So anywhere you see custom before any of these uh, words, you'll know that you can inject a custom middleware there. So custom pre middlewares, you can do pre auth, post auth. Uh, there you go, post auth right here. Uh, and then post middleware, I think, yeah, post middleware. So there, there are a lot of different steps that you can inject uh, your uh, middlewares in or plugins. And those middlewares uh, are written in uh, any gRPC supported language, Golang and Python, I believe. All right, so going back to our API, so we messed around a lot with this right here, the hello type. We showed you how to use uh, endpoint, the virtual endpoint, or sorry, the endpoint designer and all that stuff. All right, let's talk about UDG, which is what I prefer to talk about anyway, because it's probably the coolest product on the market. Uh, obviously, I don't think any of our competitors have any anything like this. Uh, they might, but I'm pretty sure they don't have full lifecycle management for GraphQL and UDG. So let's take a look at this. I'm just going to show you how this works. So you type in the name, the, uh, the listen path will be autofilled, and you can either uh, use a pre-existing GraphQL service or you can use your uh, uh, create a new one with UDG. So I'm going to go ahead and cancel out that I already have an example set up here. So UDG, everything is the same here. Uh, nothing has changed from the previous uh, API except for here, right here, the schema. So the schema can actually show you uh, what, it's just a normal GraphQL schema. It defines the objects that are returned by GraphQL and all their different fields. So as you can see, I have uh, the query. It's a user object that uh, 
takes in an ID. The user object itself has a name, email, and username. It also has posts, which are going to be this post uh, object. It's going to have a user ID title body. Now, before I go ahead, I'm just going to show you what those APIs look like. So this is the REST API for the user. This one here is for the post. And I'm also going to show you the common one, which we're actually going to be adding. So there is a common one. So uh, let's let's say uh, somebody wants the user information. Uh, they want all those that user's posts and all that user's uh, comments per post or all the comments on each of these posts. Now, if you were to do that through normal API requests, you would have to request this uh, first request for the uh, user uh, information. Then you will have to make a separate request for all their posts. And for each of these posts, you're going to have to make a request for, for all the comments for each post. So what Tech will allow you to do is it will allow you to stitch all of these together through UDG, and it will present it as a single endpoint uh, to your users. So let's go ahead and uh, add the comments section here. So we're going to add the comments to each post. And it's yelling at me because I do not have uh, uh, comments object defined. So let's go ahead and define it. I'm just going to copy paste what I have on the side here. So pretty straightforward stuff. You have a post ID, name, email, body. You can obviously saw a lot more uh, data on that endpoint. So you can actually throw in as much as you want. Okay. So now how does Tyke know where to get the information here from? So let's go into data sources and we're just going to go ahead and, uh, and go down to the post section. So at this point, Tech is expecting that the comments section is part of the API, but it's not. So let's go ahead and define where Tech can actually fetch this from. So now we can actually say, okay, I want to fetch this from, so you get to decide whether it's a Tech REST API, a Tech GraphQL API, a normal REST API, and a Graph or a GraphQL API. So I'm going to go ahead and select REST, and I'm going to copy the URL for the comments. And what's really cool here is uh, instead of, uh, you know, uh, typing in the ID here, you can actually view uh, all the different uh, uh, variables that you can actually inject in there. So you can uh, inject the ID, the user ID, body, whatever. So whatever is returned from that uh, post uh, object. So I'm going to go ahead and select ID. And I'm going to call this uh, posts comments and I'm going to go ahead and select uh, this to be a get method and uh, if you have any sort of authentication you can uh, also add your authorization here your value whatever so they can actually communicate to that endpoint and get the data that you want so I'm going to go ahead and update this field I'm going to jump into my playground so this is just a normal GraphQL request uh, to test things out. So as you, you can see, you got the username, username, uh, email, and you get the post. Now, what I would like to add is comments. So let's go ahead and add the comments. So as also, as you can see, this is uh, IntelliSense. So you can actually view uh, all these uh, different uh, variables that belong to these objects. Uh, and it will correct you if I type something like this or it will uh, under uh, red underline it to say, okay, this doesn't exist. So I'm going to grab a name, the body, and I'm just going to grab the email as well. So if we go ahead and run this, there you go. We got a post and we got a comments uh, right now. And it stitched all of these uh, on its own. So Tyke was able to go out there, fetch all the, uh, fetch all the different information that you have um and present them all as a single and a graphql endpoint this is really cool because uh instead of you as a customer going in there and modifying your apis and making all these changes tech does that automatically for you and as you saw it's very very simple to do so all right any questions so far anything relating to udg I'll give you guys a couple of seconds on the QA section. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention about the UDG right now, we do support the REST and GraphQL endpoints. We also are going to be supporting subscriptions and federations as of uh, version 4.0.
these are our biggest differentiators from Apollo, which is one of the leaders in the GraphQL uh, uh, industry. However, after uh, the release of 4.0, we we will be on par with Apollo, if not better. Uh, I personally like to think we're going to be much better, but uh, I might be biased uh, in that regard. All right, so I know we have nine minutes left and I still have not talked about the developer portal. So I'm just going to uh, quickly jump to the developer portal and uh, show you a little bit about what we can do in the developer portal. So as you can see, this is just a generic uh, developer portal. This is all customizable. So actually, let me just go ahead and log out first. So this is all customizable. Uh, first of all, you can customize the registration flow and login flow. You can customize the look and feel of the developer portal. So for example, you can there is global CSS that can be injected into this uh, as uh, uh, in version 4.0, we're also going to have global JS. And let's be honest, if global JS exists, uh, you can even write um, like a, a React app, for example, that just connects to the uh, developer portal APIs and you can overhaul that entire thing if you'd like. So very, very customizable in that regard. So let's go ahead and go to API catalog. This is where our APIs will be published. Right now, we do not have any of them. So let's go ahead and create our first API. I'm going to go in here add a new API. So again, lots of settings here. If I'm going to start talking about them, I will not finish uh, until tomorrow. So for the sake of time, I'm just going to say this is going to be the hello type API. And I'm going to select the hello type policy. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, the way this is going to work is Tyke will allow you to uh, select a policy and when users self-serve, that the key that they will get back is going to be applied through this policy. Uh, so let's jump down. You can also add documentation. So uh, Swagger, uh, API area blueprint. Uh, I'm just going to use the pet store Swagger uh, link because I'm really lazy. So I'm going to go ahead and save this. And I'm going to jump in here. And if we uh, refresh, OK, now we have this uh, really nice uh, Swagger uh documentation i'm going to go ahead and request an api it's going to tell me that you need to log in first so let's go ahead and register i'm going to register with my name i'm going to suggest a strong password i'm going to sign up awesome update the password all right let's go back and try to request the api again or, or the api key again so we'll go ahead and request and there you go now we have access to this api so if i go back in here and i uh, use this key now I have access to, oh, this is the virtual endpoint stuff still. Uh, so let's go ahead to and go to the JSON endpoint. Oh, I think I know what I did wrong. So bear with me one second. Um, there you go. I'm sorry. Uh, so what I did was I whitelisted the one endpoint, which blacklisted everything else. <laughs> so my apologies on that. Um, um, I just saw a question on the QA. I will get back to you in one minute. Uh, so sorry. So to get back to this, uh, you get the key. Now it works. Uh, everything it works as expected. Uh, you can also, as a user, you can actually view your requests, all the different requests that you have. As the API owner, you can actually jump into uh, the developer section, and you can actually see all the different developers that signed up onto your. Uh, uh, developer portal. You can see the requests that they made. You can see their policies. You can actually see analytics analytics, analytics specific to that policy. Uh, you can revoke that key. You can change the policy. So let's say you have a free tier and a platinum tier and uh, the, the default version is a free tier. They pay for your uh, different tier. So you can then change the policy and say, okay, I want to use this different policy for this guy. 
Uh, all right. So just to go back to, uh, quickly to the one of questions that I have, UDG looks really powerful. Is there a way to limit the fields uh, that get returned to the consumer? So uh, in terms of lim limiting the specific fields, this is all managed through the schema. However, if you're talking about limiting the, you know, if you're requesting an array, an array and you you want to limit uh, the return uh, or how much, how many uh, instances in that array get, that get returned, as uh, this is not supported by UDG itself. So this is a functionality. So pagination is a functionality that should be supported by the REST API or the API that you're you're using. So let's say you have a REST API that supports pagination uh, uh, like through uh, like URL parameters. You can uh, add those URL parameters to your, uh, to your uh, UDG request and it will fetch uh, X amount of uh, data. At that point, so it's not natively supported by tech. That has to be supported through uh, the API you're requesting from. I hope that answers your question. If it does not, please let me know. Uh, I'm gonna type in my. Uh, actually, I'll go ahead and type in my uh, email right now in the chat. And if anybody has any uh, questions, please do not hesitate to uh, to reach out. Um, oh. Last thing I wanted to talk about, I just wanted to jump back to the virtual endpoint because that did not work the first time because I messed up. So uh, we're just gonna sh quickly show you how this would work. So uh, let's go in here and go to virtual. Now that it's all set up and that I took out the, if I can spell, uh, that I took out the uh, whitelisting. So now you get a virtual endpoint. Again, you can just go in there and uh, do whatever you need to do so let's say I want to change the response. Uh, let's say from type and go ahead and update. And we send the request again. And there you go. This is a virtual response from type. So uh, very customizable. You can run all the different JavaScript uh, uh, logic that you need to do and uh, go from there. All right, uh, one last thing. I'm sorry, I know this is taking uh, a little longer, so I'm just gonna go ahead and create my UDG endpoint. So uh, the difference between the UDG or the GraphQL uh, APIs that you publish is uh, how the document documentation is, is displayed. So for this one, we're gonna do social media app, and we're gonna select the UDG policy. And in here, uh, for documentation, uh, what you would have to do is you would have to enable documentation through the uh, GraphQL Playground. So we'll go ahead and save. And let's jump into the API catalog. We'll look at the social media app. And now this is all gonna be just uh, a, a, like a UDG or a GraphQL um, Playground. What this will allow you to do is, is it will uh, allow you to show you all the documentation that you put in your schema. So you can actually put your documentation in your schema and will show up here. And it will actually show you the different types uh, or the different uh, uh, objects inside this GraphQL query. So for example, we have this user object. This user object is expecting an ID. All right, awesome. So we did that. All right, okay. So what does the user object contain? Okay, the user object contains a name. It has a string or sorry, uh, an email really does not want to type enter. Okay, there you go, email and username. And we're also gonna look for posts here. All right, okay, so what does the post object have? Again, you have a title and body. So we're just gonna do a title. And if we go ahead and send this, there you go. So again, pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, really cool, allow you to uh, drill down into the schema and view all the different objects and their variables. All right, so I know we're out of time and I took the entire uh, 50 minutes. So if anybody has any questions, I did leave my uh, email in the chat. So please do not hesitate to reach out to me and ask any questions if you guys have anything. All right, thank you so much for joining and uh, have yourself a wonderful day.